So last time we started talking about open mappings and we proved the open mapping lemma. So I'll just remind you, an open mapping was one where the image of every open set was open, which is sort of in the opposite direction from a continuous map where the pre-image of every open set would be open. And so a homeomorphism is a map which is both continuous and is an open mapping, and is a bijection. So I observed this lemma which I left you to check, well, this proposition, yeah, that being an open mapping is the same as being able to get at each element y in the codomain as the image of some element x whose norm is not too much bigger than the norm of y. So the norm of x in the codomain, uh, in the domain, is less than to some constant times the norm of y in the codomain, um, and you can get t of x equals y. That's equivalent to being an open mapping. But then we prove the open mapping lemma, which had uh, the following. So you had a map from a Banach space to a normal space. So here it's important that x is the Banach space to make this bit work. y didn't have to be yet, but under these conditions y turned out to be complete. And instead of being able to actually get exactly to each element y in the codomain, um, using the element of x in the domain whose norm was not too big, instead you, you got within alpha of elements whose norm was at most 1, using elements in the domain whose norm was at most m. So this was uh, sort of being almost subjective and almost an open mapping, and then it turned out that um, the completeness of x took you home, and it turned out that you were um, subjective and you were an open mapping. And the price was that you had to divide the first constant you started with, which was the one that helped you get close, you had to divide it by 1 minus alpha, which it tells you how close alpha was to 1. Um, alpha being sort of the error left after you approximate an element of norm 1. So if alpha is close to 1, that means your approximation is not very good. But one special case is where alpha is 0. When alpha is 0, this is valid. I do allow alpha equals 0 here. When alpha equals 0, the, then you actually have a map that's onto. And all this says is that if you're an open mapping, you're an open mapping except that uh, it includes the fact that that force is y to be surjective. So one special case of this that's maybe worth noting, special case when alpha equals 0, um, k equals m over 1 minus alpha is equal to m, And one, over, 1 and 2 don't tell you anything new. So 1 just says basically what you knew before, that you're an open mapping. And 2 says you're surjective and that you're an open mapping, which again, you can read off from the fact that alpha is 0. But you still pick up 3 straight away. So in fact, this special case, so the special case, If x is a Banach space, and y is a norm space, and t is a continuous linear map from x to y, is an open mapping, so it's a continuous linear map, and it's onto, and it's open. Then y must be complete. So y is a balanced space. But that's a special case uh, of this result. OK, so then we proved that we prove the general one.
And I want to say, make one comment about one of the things we did twice in the proof. We used the following. Well, we proved it twice, really, which we, we didn't, shouldn't really have needed to do. Um, for t in b of x, y, continuous linear map from x to y, if sum from n equals 1 to infinity xn is a convergent series in x, then the sum of the images is a convergent series in Y. And sum from n equals 1 to infinity Txn is T of the sum from n equals 1 to infinity Xn. which is, of course, equal to the limit as m tends to infinity of the sub from n equals 1 up to little m of Txn equals the limit as m tends to infinity of T of sum from n equals 1 to m of Xn. Uh, it's this first bit that we pretty much proved twice in the middle of the last proof and, and perhaps if one just noted that this was true separately it would save you a little bit of writing. Right. Okay, so now what can you do with the open mapping lemma? Here's one of the things you can do with it. So you don't need the open mapping lemma to do this one, but um, the point is that this quotient map from E to E over F is actually an open map. So you've got a Banach space E at a closed subspace F, and you look at E over F, and you've got the quotient map. Q from E goes to E over F is actually an open map, an open mapping. And uh, I'll, I'll give you a few more details of that in a second. Um, because it's an open mapping, and it's, uh, so it's already subject to an open mapping, and then the special case takes you home, where you can take alpha equals zero, um, you can take any m bigger than one, for example, m equals two. I'll, I'll, I'll remind you why that two is in a moment. Um, that will, so that means you can quotient out a Banach space by a closed linear subspace and get another Banach space, and that's quite a useful construction. Quite often you've got some closed subspace that you want to eliminate, and you just quotient out by it to get rid of it. And you don't want to lose your completeness. Here's an, a nice exercise. See if you can do this one. Um, again, on the tricky side, so uh, it, it, comes on, it comes in on, on the one of the trickier ones compared to the ones on the exercise sheets. Not as hard as the ones on the challenging sheet, though. Uh, you have to show that E is complete. If and only if... Uh, well, OK. One implication is trivial. If F is a closed subspace of a Banach space, then it would be complete and we've just, uh, we're just about to observe that the quotient is complete. It's a converse that's interesting. So, so we proved um, the only if already. Um, but the if is, in other words, 
if both F and E over F are complete, proving that um, E itself is complete is more interesting. Then uh, this exercise here, actually, I've chopped this exercise up into two pieces which appear on separate question sheets. So I've, I've, this can be divided into two stages. Um, and the first stage doesn't need the open mapping lemma and appears on question sheet five, question number five. And then the next, the rest of it appears on sheet six, question three. So chopping it up into slightly easier sub-steps should make it possible for you. Um, as a consequence of this, you get that uh, every separable Banach space is isomorphic as a Banach space, not isometric, but isomorphic to some quotient of little l1. So you can find, so you can essentially, not isometrically, but at least isomorphically as a Banach space, find a copy of every separable Banach space as a quotient of little l1. So little l1's got plenty of interesting quotients. Okay, so let's have a look at this um, claim that the quotient map is an open map. Where F is a closed subspace of E. That's a linear subspace of E. Well, let Xi be in the quotient. Then norm Xi is the infimum. This is the definition of the quotient norm, one of the definitions of the quotient norm, of the norm X, where X is in E, and Q of X equals Xi. Oh, come on. That's better. That's the definition, one of the definitions of the quotient norm. So it's the infimum... Um, Sorry, tr tricky reading it because of the braces and the size. No, it's the squiggle. What's the squiggle? That squiggle at the end? Or, the squiggle. or the letter? The letter, yeah. the letter is a Greek psi. So it's got two squiggles in it. I like, I like using uh, Greek letters for elements of the quotient space, but uh, you can use any other letter you like. You can call it Y if you want. Hmm? Use an H. An H. Okay. Well, I don't mind. But you can practice your Greek letters if you want. Uh, right, so what is it? Um, so, well, okay, I suppose it's possible that Xi is zero in which case you can take x equals zero. But in all cases, you could definitely find um, an x whose norm is no more than, say, twice the norm of xi, who, I mean, you could do one plus epsilon, but let's use two. We've got plenty of room. So we can take 
m equals 2, or you can use 1 plus epsilon, and alpha equals 0, q is actually surjective, or you can use any, any alpha smaller than 1 will do. And we can find x in x with um, norm x at most m times the norm of psi with qx equals psi. So that norm of qx minus psi is definitely less than or equal to alpha times norm of psi. So the conditions of the open mapping lemma, or indeed the special case of it, are satisfied. OML for the open mapping lemma. So uh, we already knew that Q was surjective. Q is an open mapping, and the quotient is surjective. And the quotient is complete. Did I say surjective? So that's the uh, proof of that corollary. That one um, you can do directly, but you're effectively using the fact that it's an open map when you do it directly. So uh, you can have a think about other ways of proving that. Any questions about uh, the open mapping lemma and uh, quotient space so far? Okay. So now, going to have a, a little short section on Eurozone's lemma and the Tietze extension theorem. Um, I'm not going to do the proof of the Tietze extension theorem this year because we're a little short of time um, and we've got to get this measure and integration stuff in. So uh, when it comes to the proof of the Tietze extension theorem, you can look back at the notes from, say, 2006 to 7. Um, there's also now... Uh, a University of Nottingham U Now module, which includes the material from 2007 to 8 as well. So, in fact, there's an awful lot of material available online. So, so let me say, see also um, 2006 to 7 notes and 2007 to 8 material on. Nottingham U now. So if you find out about Nottingham's U now, which is something like U now dot Nottingham dot AC dot UK. And I will give away a secret. You can actually find the answers to the unassessed course worksheets there. But, of course, it would be a waste of time for you to read the answers before trying the problems. You won't find the answers to, the, to any assessed course right there. So, the proof of teacher extension theorem won't be examinable. Anything I do tell you about it, and the statements of it, and applications of it, and so on, are examinable. So, well, the first result, Eurozone's lemma, works for any normal topological space. 
And we know that compact Hausdorff spaces are normal. That's on one of the question sheets. And we know that uh, metric spaces are normal. Actually, I think some of this stuff was done in uh, metric and topological spaces module anyway. So here's what Eurizen's lemma says. It's actually quite a tricky lemma in the full generality. And so we certainly won't prove it in full generality. But what I will remind you of is the incredibly quick proof for metric spaces because it's such a nice proof. I will write down the formula for the function that does it. So what, what you have to do, uh, the idea is to try to separate some closed sets from each other using a continuous function. So you'll have your, your whole set is x. So this is x is the whole thing. And in there, you've got E, and you've got F. And uh, G is defined on the whole of X, and it's continuous. So naught is less than equal to G of X is less than equal to 1 out here. G is constantly 0 on E. So I'll just write G three lines zero to mean it's zero all the time. And G is constantly one on F. So it's identically, so G is identically zero on E. So that's uh, G of X equals zero for all X in E. And G is identically one on F. Now, you couldn't expect to do that to any odd pair of sets because if you have two sets whose closures overlap, you can't do this. So the safest thing, you can do this if um, the sets E and F have got disjoint closures. But if they don't have disjoint closures, you definitely can't. So, so in a normal topological space, deciding whether you can separate two sets, it's if and only if they've got disjoint closures. You might as well just say that they're closed in the first place um, and disjoint to do this. And uh, in a metric space, assuming E and F are, are non empty, which aren't in the statement, you don't have to assume they're non empty, but if they're empty, it's really boring and trivial. So given E and F are non-empty, you can set g of x to be... Does anyone remember the formula? Can anyone remember the formula for the function that does it? Um, yes. Yes? That's right. It's wonderful. You can write down the formula, a formula for it, and this function just does it straight away. Um, whereas the proof in a general normal topological space goes on for pages. <laughs> but in a metric space, the proof is one line. Well, OK, there's some subtle, there's some stuff hiding behind there. You have to make sure this makes sense. You're not dividing by zero. You have to explain why it's continuous and why it's got the right values. But essentially, that, that does it. Um, so for metric spaces, it's, it's really nice I, that you've just got a formula like this. I'll just remind you just a couple of the features of that. Um, e and F are disjoint closed sets. And in a metric space, if you're not in a closed set, then you have strictly positive distance to it. So since you can't be in both E and F, at least one of the things on the bottom is positive, strictly positive. So you're never dividing by zero. Um, if you're in E, then distance of X to E is zero, so you get zero. If you're in F, then distance of X to F is zero, so you get one, and that's it. Oh, and it's obviously the thing on the bottom is at least as big as the thing on top, so you're taking values between naught and one. And it's even, even got better properties that... You, would, you didn't ask for this, but it's only zero, this one, if you're in E, and it's only one if you're in F. So you don't have any... Uh, so you even get strict inequality outside 
um, which is more than you asked for, but it doesn't matter. Okay, so that's Urizen's lemma for metric spaces. And we could now prove, but um, as I say, C 2006 to 7 notes for details of the proof. It's a pity we haven't got time. It's a nice, in nice neat little proof, but uh, let's leave it out this year. But here's the result. It's about extensions. You've got a closed subset of a compact Hausdorff space, and you've got a continuous function defined on that closed subset. And you want to know, can you extend it and make a continuous function defined on the whole space taking the same values on that subset. And then having done so, can you do that without increasing its norm? Which norm? The uniform norm. So, if you use the notation um, what if E to be the uniform norm on E, which is quite a standard notation, though uh, this is something used by uh, Garth Dales in his book, he's my research supervisor, so he uses this mod f sub, sub named set to be the uniform norm on a given set. Um, so, so we want the extension defined on the whole of x to have the same uniform norm. So that's the uh, uniform norm on x. And, of course, so F tilde is in continuous functions. That's continuous real valued functions defined on X. F is in, F started in the continuous real valued functions defined on E. And F tilde is an extension of F, so that's F tilde restricted to E equals F. And what you do is you apply the open mapping lemma to the restriction map. So the proof is you apply the open mapping lemma to the restriction map, which is a nice linear map. Call it R from CR of X to CR of E, which takes G to G restricted to E. And when you use, your, you can use Eurism's lemma to show that the conditions of the open mapping lemma are satisfied. A nice little trick. Um, you need the Eurizen's lemma. You can show that uh, the conditions of the open mapping lemma are satisfied in a rather unusual way with um, that m equals a third, if I remember correctly, m equals a third, oh, I better not, I better not do it out of the top of my head. Um, it's something where the, where the final constant comes out to be 1. No. In such a way that m over 1 minus alpha is actually equal to 1. I can't remember whether it's m is two-thirds and alpha is a third, or m is one-third and alpha is two-thirds. But uh, um, and that gives uh, gives everything. Anyway, you might want to look at that for interest. Um, it's quite nice, though, to deduce the complex-value teacher extension theorem from the real one. Now, what you might say is, fine, take the real part of your function, your, you've got a complex value of continuous function, you want to extend it, so take the real part and the imaginary part, and that'll give you a couple of real valued continuous functions, and you can extend them, and that's right. You can even extend them with the same norm. So you end up with a new complex valued function, 
whose real part is an extension of the old real part and with the same norm as the old real part. And the new imaginary part extends the old imaginary part and with the same norm as the old imaginary part. But unfortunately, that doesn't tell you that the uniform norm of the new complex valued function is the same as the old uniform norm. But you can fix it, it turns out, by a nice little trick, which you'll find on the question sheet, where if the norm gets too big, you just push it back down to where it started. Um, so if, if the u norm you're trying to get to is R, and you have a function whose norm on the subset used to be R, but now it's gone bigger, you can fix it with this function. This is a nice function that fixes anything whose norm is bigger than, what, bigger than R by squashing it back down. So it leaves things unchanged if they're inside the unit circle. So this is just on the complex plane. And anything outside the unit circle, so here, hr of z equals z in here. But outside, here's z. You go on a straight line to the origin, and there's hr of z. And this is a nice continuous map for the complex plane to itself, which fixes anything whose modulus has gone too big and puts it back down to the circle of radius r. And so if your extension did have norms slightly too big, you can fix it this way. Um, it's a nice trick. Right. But now I want to get on to more important stuff, beginning to discuss the open mapping theorem and the Banach isomorphism theorem. So remember, our target is to prove that if you've got a continuous, linear surjection between Banach spaces, then it has to be an open map, which is a bit like proving some... And so in particular, if it's one-to-one, -one, that tells you the inverse map is automatically continuous, which is something special about Banach spaces. And you need both the, co the domain and the codomain to be Banach spaces to make this theorem work. Now, you want the domain to be a Banach space to make to, in order to be able to use the open mapping lemma, you want the codomain to be Banach space in order to be able to apply the bare category theorem. Now, before we prove this theorem, we need to have a little discussion of convex and symmetric sets and a nice little lemma about them. What's a convex set? Um, you're in a vector space and you've just got some subset. You're convex if, basically, any, whenever you've got two points in your subset and you draw a line joining them, straight line joining them. Every point on the line between must be in as well. So, so here's A, and here's um, your point little a and your point little b, and then you draw a line joining them. And the points on this line all have the form TA plus 1 minus TB, with t in naught 1, t between naught and 1. That's the, and that's the lines joining A to B. So if to, be, to be convex, then you can't leave the set by travelling on a straight line between one point of the set and another point of the set. Fitting with your usual idea of sort of convex polygons in the plane and so on. But this is, this is in the general vector space. Symmetric about zero, I'm... I sometimes think it should be symmetrical. I think that people use either, so or symmetrical. But I, I'm going to use symmetric. Oops. Symmetrical. Well, it's not very good, but it'll do. Um. Oh, let's redo that last bit. Symmetrical about the origin, if every x in A minus x is also in A. So convex symmetric sets include things like the closed unit ball, the open unit ball, and so on. Closed unit ball, open unit ball, or of course, not just unit ball, but ball centers on the origin. So more generally, 
any ball centered on the origin. And of course, any linear subspace. Linear subspaces are much better than this, but they certainly are symmetric about the origin and convex. Now, linear map, obviously, linear maps commute with linear combinations. So a linear map will take convex sets to convex sets, and they'll take symmetric sets to symmetric sets. So um, that's going to be useful to us at a moment. So this sort of set is preserved by linear maps. And then we have a little lemma. And this is a slight generalization of something you already saw before. What does this look like? So this says if you've got a convex, if you've got a convex subset of a norm space, and it's got non-empty interior and it's symmetric about zero, so or you could say if it's if it's symmetric about zero and it's convex and it's got non-empty interior, okay, three conditions, then it must be a neighbor to zero. Now, what does that remind you of from earlier in the module? If anything. Okay, so that was, it's, it's like, so a convex set under these conditions doesn't have to equal the whole space, but if it had been a linear subspace, then it did. So it is like the earlier result, where if a linear subspace has non-empty interior, then it must be the whole space, which we did by observing that if there was a little ball in it, then there had to be another little ball centered on the origin in it, and then finish from there. That wasn't the only proof, by the way. There are some other proofs as well. Um, so, so in fact, you could deduce the earlier result for this one, and by proving this one first, because linear subspaces satisfy this condition of being symmetric about the origin and convex. But this time the conclusion is not that you get everything, merely that um, you can move your little ball centered on the origin to be centered, uh, your little ball somewhere in the set. You can just push it to the origin. And it's a bit of a neat trick. So this says exactly that, but it says a bit more. Not only that, if you found a point in your convex set, and so notice in this one it says, if x is in E, but you could have said, from what's coming on, you could have said if x is in A, because in a moment you're going to assume that this ball is centered on it. So if you've got a point in the interior, and a particular radius, so that the ball is contained in A, then the same radius ball set on the origin is, uh, is also in your convex set A. And let me just give you a quick sketch as to why that's true. So here's your origin. Here's your symmetric convex set. And here's your point X and your little ball. ball radius, uh, ball in E, centers on X radius R, which is still inside A. Well, you go to minus X, which is also in A, and then, in fact, you take minus everything in that ball, and when you take minus everything in that ball, you find that everything in the same ball centers on minus X is in. So that's the ball in E centered on minus X radius R. And then you take averages. And if you average the points in here with the corresponding points in here, you get a half of the sum, and you get this ball. But I'll, I'll do that in proper detail at the beginning next time. I'll, I'll fill in the details of that at the beginning of the next one. And then we'll use that to prove some of the big theorems, open mapping theorem, then we'll move on and do um, Banach isomorphism theorem, closed graph theorem. And then we should be able to uh, get on with chapter six, I think, um, and finish off all the pre banach algebra material.
Okay, so we'll stop there for today.